Okay. So hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. Today we are joined with Communicate Health um, and they are going to cover the topic of inclusive research. Um, this is methods to meet the needs of individuals with limited literacy skills. We have Nakiva Redmond, Brittany Linton, and Carrie Cower that are that are presenting today. Um, this webinar will be recorded and it will be made available within 72 hours um, at the conclusion of this particular webinar. One thing I would like to announce is that everybody has been muted. Um, we do have a tab at the bottom of the screen for Q&A. So if you have any questions for the speakers, please feel free to drop your uh, questions in the Q&A um, chat box. Upcoming, we have a short course on Friday, um, which is Effective Personas for Jobs to be Done Framework. So if you're familiar with the, Ch the JTBD framework um, and you want to find if more information about it, feel free to sign up for that course. Um, and it's not too late. That course uh, does start on Friday and it's for the remaining um, three weeks of August to take that course. Uh, next, we have the UXPA International 2020 Conference at home. So as you guys know, due to um, our current uh, pandemic, the 2020 conference will be held at home. There's more information to come on that, but expect that conference um, in October. If you're interested in any more future short courses and webinars, please frequent um, our UX education tab on uxpa.org. And um, we have a number of webinars upcoming as well as short courses, so please stay in tune. So without further ado, I want to introduce uh, Nakiva, Brady, and Carrie from Communicate Health. And I know that this is a joint um, UXPA QRCA uh, webinar, so welcome everyone from QRCA. And uh, yes, I will let our presenters um, take it away. Thanks, Carm. Uh, I appreciate it. Uh, and thanks to everyone for being here today. Uh, I'm Carrie, and before we get into our more detailed introductions and discussion today, uh, I just want to say thanks again to USDA and QRCA for hosting us um, to talk about inclusive research and how we at Communicate Health blend uh, both traditional qualitative methods with UX um, and human-centered design approaches to solve for health-related issues. Uh, we know that many folks across different sectors and verticals have been doing uh, inclusive research for a while today. Uh, so we're, we're really excited to share what we're doing at Communicate Health and also look forward to your comments and your questions um, towards the end of our chat. So I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, Nikiva, to uh, just get us started with some introductions. Hey, thanks, Carrie. So I'll start. Thanks for having me today. I'm Nikiva Redman. I'm a senior research manager at Communicate Health. Um, in my role at Communicate Health, I manage a number of different research projects across the company, um, including feasibility studies, material testing, formative research, and persona research as well. Um, and I also get the opportunity to work across a range of different clients across different sectors. So some healthcare, government, pharmaceutical clients in there. So with that, I will pass it to you, Brittany. Thanks, Akiva. Hi, everyone. My name is Brittany Linton, um, and I'm a UX research associate at Communicate Health. So I also work across various projects doing usability testing and other qualitative research studies. Um, and then I also do work with web analytics and web evaluation to see how we can use more quantitative measures to understand traffic. And then also this helps us inform further research and changes we want to make to websites. And I'll pass it over to Carrie. Thanks. And uh, yeah, again, I'm Carrie Tower. Uh, I'm a senior research scientist at Communicate Health um, and lean more towards user experience and human centered design. Um, and like Brittany and Akiva, I'm across a lot of different projects, um, mostly consulting over the different client work that we have and lean a little bit more towards uh, doing work around contextual inquiry, ethnographic work, um, but all the way ranging from sort of our standard usability testing, um, as well as more of our traditional IDIs and qualitative work. So um, again, we're really happy to be here and sort of chat through the stuff that we're doing. 
Um, so I will uh, just tell us, uh, tell you all a little bit about what Communicate Health is um, and what our mission is. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, it's to improve the lives, improve lives by designing health information products and digital tools that are easy to understand. So the bottom line for us really is that we think people deserve clear and simple information about their health. Um, so CH is a health communication firm and we work at the intersection of plain language, health literacy and human centered design. And our goal is um, to get the right info to the right audiences in a way that they can understand. Um, and I'll talk about this a little bit more in depth on the next slide, but all of our work is also grounded in a human-centered design process. So this might look very familiar to many of you out there um, and might look similar to a process that you use. Um, we do use the human-centered design uh, that a lot of other folks um, like IDEO, and obviously this is coming from the Stanford uh, Design School. We take this approach as well in terms of how we go through our um, research process all the way through to designing products. Um, and as you can see here with the stars, we really emphasize that empathize phase in our research where we're really trying to understand our audiences and learn about um, the people for whom we're designing, um, as well as the define phase. So really just defining what those problems or issues are as well. Um, and then obviously testing. And again, this isn't a linear process for us as it probably isn't a linear process for most of you but we do employ these um, different approaches and different methods, pulling from human-centered design um, and really focus on that empathized phase, particularly for the research um, part of the work that we do. So our approach is grounded in, a, in this process um, and we have expertise across the company in UX, both in research and design, health communication, behavior change and plain language. So how does all of this fit in with an inclusive research approach. Um, so I'm gonna pass it over to my colleague, Brittany, and she's gonna talk a little bit through um, the approach that we use in terms of inclusive research at Communicate Health. Brittany, I think you're still muted. Thank you, thank you. Um, so like Carrie mentioned, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about inclusive research, uh, what that means, and then how health literacy plays a role in being inclusive. So inclusive research can mean a lot of different things for different people, but at CH, we focus on reaching audiences that have previously been excluded in research. So uh, we believe that we're ethically responsible for gathering data from participants whose voices are historically marginalized or unaccounted for. So these audiences might not be the traditional super users and oftentimes they represent a smaller population of people, but that doesn't mean they're still not affected by the websites and tools that we use today. And in order to reach these audiences, we sometimes have to go beyond the database. So Oftentimes, vendors and other recruitment companies won't include people with low health literacy skills or other disabilities in their database or panel. And sometimes we have to have more strategic um, avenues when doing our recruitment. Also, it's important to use methods that are appropriate for these populations just to make it a little easier for them to participate. So it's important to keep plain language and inclusivity in mind when designing our research studies. So that could be how we design our research questions, recruitment, or other protocols. And then we also like to consider the whole context when analyzing our data. So understanding health literacy levels of our, of our participants and synthesizing that data, and then com coming up with recommendations that are appropriate for this, these audiences. But ultimately, we have many, many practices that we use to ensure that our research is inclusive. And we'll go into a little bit more about that later on. But on our next slide, um, before we dive into the connection between inclusive research and health literacy, I want to start with a little bit more context about health literacy. So we all know there's a lot going on right now in the country and the world. And, you know, we have COVID-19 pandemic, and then there's been a bright light that shined on systematic racism and discrimination. 
and also economic uncertainty. So information is ever changing and people are consuming media at increased rates. Actually 66% of social media users believe their social media uses has increased due to COVID-19. And research also estimates that people will log about 82 minutes a day on social media sites. So that's a lot of information to consume and that's either gonna be easy or not easy to understand. Additionally, um, we are in the midst of an unprecedented infodemic. So there's a lot of misinformation, falsehoods everywhere, which in some cases can lead to pretty severe health consequences. So ultimately that's why health literacy is so important. It's a person's ability to access, understand and use health information. So using clear communication like health literacy and plain language best practices are even more important to communicate messages that actually stick. And overall, health literacy is a state of being, it's not a trait. So for an example, a person's access to healthcare could mean their physical access, like the distance between a facility, or access in regard to understanding a form, website, or other type of resource. So with all that information in mind about health literacy, uh, we'd like to do a little health literacy trivia just to gauge what everybody thinks about how health literacy affects our population. So I'm going to chat out a link in the Zoom to a quick survey. So you can take a few, moment, few moments to complete the survey and then um, Carrie will review, review the results. Yeah, so as Brittany mentioned, um, there is a link for you in the, the chat link in Zoom. So go ahead and take a moment to fill that out and we'll kind of watch, watch the numbers come in. Um, and the question is, uh, what percentage of the U.S. population has limited or low health literacy? And it's a multiple choice question. So um, we'll give you a few minutes to take some time to fill that out. Take about another five seconds or so to get your answers in. Okay, so your options were 50%, 95%, or 20%. Um, and 66% of those of you in the audience said it's about 50% of the population that has limited or low health literacy. 25% um, of you out there said that it's 95% of the um, population that has limited or low health literacy. And then 12% of you said it's about 25%. That was a lot for me to articulate because I am absolutely a qualitative person. So I'm just proud of myself for getting through all those percentages as, as clearly as hopefully that I did. You should also see that on your screen too when you open that up in your um, poll. So let's go on to, to the next slide then and sort of chat through this. Um, so you might be surprised to know, and many of you were pretty spot on, that when we talk about limited literacy, it is about 50% um, of the population that have limited literacy. But when we talk about limited health literacy, we are looking at a, a, approximately 90% of the population in the US um, has limited health literacy. So it's important, again, for us to contextualize that this is US based data that we're chatting through here. Um, so when we think about literacy, um, basically that equals being able to read. When we think about health literacy, though, we're thinking about a couple of other different things. So it's being able to read. Um, understand and use information to make health decisions. Um, many more people struggle with this. So let's break this down a little bit further um, and we'll chat through this in the next slide. So this slide and this, this diagram is basically showing some um, really basic health literacy tasks, which is mapped to people's skill level. So these are 
all skills that people need to stay healthy. Um, and as you can see, health insurance is up at the more difficult end because it's, a, a, it's something that a lot of people, a lot of people struggle with. Um, so you can see a different task. So understanding it over, over the counter drug label, um, there's, there's about 30% of folks out there who have really a uh, challenge, have a difficult time or a difficult challenge understanding that information. Um, and that goes up with, you can see things like using a vaccination chart and then again, calculating an employee's share of health insurance costs for a year. Um, so we do a range of this kind of work at Communicate Health where we're kind of looking across the board at all of this. Um, but certainly I think the, the diagram is pretty telling and most of you, um, most of you chose that about 50% of the U.S. population had limited or low health literacy, but a lot of the data that we've collected on this and this out there shows us that it's actually a lot more individuals have limited um, or low health literacy, which is, which is pretty telling in the work that we do. Um, for the next slide, uh, you can, we'll dive a little bit deeper into what does it mean to be people with uh, or a person with limited health literacy skills. Um, these folks are likely to have more issues with working memory uh, than their higher literacy counterparts. So memory, memorizing things like dosage for pills, those sorts of things come into play here. They're more likely to get distracted, reread words, lose their place, um, especially when we're talking about some very complex health jargon. Uh, that makes it even more challenging for these folks. Um, and they perhaps give up reading altogether or they give up an abandoned site if they're looking at this stuff on, on digital products and tools. Um, they are able to accomplish tasks, however, when materials and, and tools are designed well and then when they use plain language. And so we have some interesting um, examples of that on the next slide. One of the things that we really like to think about at Communicate Health and one of our founding principles at CH is that is the principle for designing with people with limited health literacy. So keeping that in mind um, actually benefits everyone. So while we do a lot of work with folks who are on that scale of limited or low health literacy, we also do quite a bit of research and testing um, with people who are professionals on our digital tools and websites. And they also have challenges understanding complex health information as well. Um, so also when we think about the limited time and short attention span, those principles benefit not only those with limited literacy and cognitive processing issues, but also people who wanna scan quickly through something like dense text or wanna get a main message. So a lot of this works actually for everyone. So the study that you're seeing here uh, from Catherine Summers, it focuses on her usability studies on people with limited literacy skills or those who may have disabilities. So compared with high or low literacy users, um, when we redesigned a site or when they redesigned a site using low liter literacy audience principles, it actually improved time on task and success rates for everyone, even those with more um, high literacy participants. So we do a lot of testing with people with limited literacy, but again, we also are testing professionals, people with PhDs and MDs, and what we see um, mirrors the kind of stuff that you're seeing here from Catherine Summers' work is that these principles actually help everyone and that our clients often overestimate the savviness of their professional audiences. Um, we also like to think of this in the context too, is when we're thinking about health information, sometimes that information is often very challenging or scary um, so even someone without low health literacy, maybe who's newly, um, has newly had a, a baby and they're exhausted uh, and they're trying to read health information for their child at three o'clock in the morning and they're very sleep deprived. Um, designing for those cases, designing for low health literacy patients also helps individuals in those cases too, right? So the context in which we design products and services is also, also really important. So as you can see here in this chart, um, when we designed for low health literacy participants, what happened for the high health literacy, high health literacy users was that they were three times as fast on the revised site than they were before, um, and that they had a 93% success rate on the revised site compared to 68% with the original. So designing for low health literacy actually benefits everyone is the, the key point there. 
So what is the connection then between health literacy and inclusive research, which really is going to be the bulk of our uh, conversation today. So that we, we know that health literacy is associated with race, lower education, uh, lower socioeconomic status, employment status, and age. Um, and we also know that populations with these characteristics are less likely to be recruited and engaged in research, as Brittany was chatting about earlier. Um, and they're also less likely to then participate. This is obviously problematic because it's a group that we're not getting feedback from um, and is a real missed opportunity to make materials easier to understand. Um, and again, not only for low health literacy folks, but across the board. Um, and there's also ethics involved with that. It, it, our approach is that it is unethical to exclude vulnerable, vulnerable groups. Um, and it's definitely a missed opportunity when we're trying to inform design. So the remainder of the presentation is going to help you see um, ways and also we'll offer some tips so that you can be more inclusive um, in your in your UX research work um, and in in working with individuals with low or limited health literacy as well. So we have um, one more trivia or poll for you all to do. So I'm going to go ahead and put this in the chat as well. Um, because it'll be helpful for us to get a sense of how many of you are actually um, working in organizations or if you are personally working um, on inclusive research approaches in the work that you do. So go ahead and please take a moment or so to fill out this next poll. Um, and the question is, do you or your organization have an inclusive research approach? Um, so take a few minutes to fill that out uh, and then we'll chat through uh, some of your answers that you have here. Carrie, I think you're on mute. I reposted the link. Sorry about that, folks. Uh, hopefully that will that will come through for you. And I'm going to go ahead and activate that. Okay, let's take another couple of moments, seconds here to get in your get in your answers. Okay, so it looks like some of the uh, responses are in. Um, not at all. 35% of you said, not at all, I'm not sure how to do this. 52% uh, said it depends on the project and 13% said it's total pro. Um, and some of you I know are in between jobs, looking in school, those sorts of things. So um, sorry that, that that option was not included for you, but this really helps us get a sense of the, the range of folks that we have here. Um, knowing that some of you are doing this a bit, there, some of you are old pros that have been doing it a long time and some of you are new to this. So this is really helpful to get that um, sense of who is in our audience. And I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Nikiva um, to talk about how we use an inclusive research approach at C8. 
Yeah, thanks, Gary. So now that we're all in the mindset of inclusive research, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about using inclusive research process um, and what that looks like in action, and then hopefully give some practical examples at each step of that process that uh, you all can implement in your own organizations. So just to give a brief overview of the research process, um, when we talk about this, we're really talking about these three main steps. So the first step is planning. And during the step, we're constructing those research questions that will guide the entire study. We're recruiting participants and we're designing materials for participation like consent forms. In the implementation step here, this uh, middle step, we're actually in data collection. So this may be in-depth interviews or for many of you usability sessions or product testing. Um, and during this phase, we're using those research protocols that we developed in the planning stage, like the moderator's guide. And then lastly, in the analysis and reporting phase, during this phase, we're really looking at all the data we collected um, and using a collaborative process to analyze these data. So we're engaging a range of perspectives during this process to make sure that we're really giving contextual perspective to the recommendations that we put forward. Um, so let's, let's dive a little bit into each of these steps a bit more um, and discuss what we're, do, what we're doing at CH um, to contribute to that inclusive research process. So starting with planning, one of uh, the most important steps in the planning phase um, when it comes to inclusive research is recruitment. So we really have to be strategic in how we're conducting recruitment to make sure we're including people who are otherwise missed with more traditional recruitment strategies. And Brittany kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, um, but I'll talk about some of our strategies that we use uh, to recruit individuals who may have low health literacy skills. So one of those um, strategies that we use are partnering with community organizations. So we know that people with low health literacy may not be included in those panels or within databases of the more traditional professional recruiters. So to work around this, we've had success uh, with partnering with a number of community-based organizations who already have those established connections with the populations that we're interested in. Um, some of these organizations may include like retirement communities we've engaged before, um, some federally qualified health centers and public health departments. Another strategy we've used is engaging recruitment vendors who are in rural and low resource areas. So we found that when recruiting participants from larger recruitment vendors with locations only in those major cities, their panels and their participants tend to skew higher literacy levels. Um, and so while these databases from recruiters in the rural and low resource areas are often smaller, um, they, they tend to have developed relationships with their panels over the years and have that word of mouth um, recruitment to build their databases so their participants are likely to participate um, in the research. And we've also had better success in finding those participants with low health literacy skills that way. Um, the third point here, we also try to use cash incentives when possible for participants um, to incentivize them after the research. So this gives participants more flexibility in how they spend their incentive as compared to like a gift card or sometimes if you're a part of panels, um, you're uh, compensated with points. Uh, so we try to use cash um, uh, for incentives for our participants. And um, we also often provide an additional incentive for parking or other travel costs. Uh, we know that transportation to sessions can sometimes be a barrier for participants for actually um, being engaged in the research. So these are strategies, of course, that we use once we reach and engage participants in research, but they're important to make sure that uh, participating in research is more accessible to those, um, to those individuals. So another important piece of the planning stage is screening. We screen for participants with limited literacy and uh, low health literacy skills, and we do this in a couple different ways. Um, 
The first is uh, we use proxy measures around education, income, and health information seeking behaviors. We've also incorporated a more direct measure for low uh, and limited health literacy, including uh, this three item scale that is shown on the slide. Um, and this asks questions around um, individuals' uh, confidence in filling out their medical forms, how difficult they find written materials about their health conditions and how often they may actually look for help with reading medical materials. Um, and so, as you can see, both of these strategies, they're three item scales. So they're short and they're digestible for our participants to get through um, when we include them in our screeners. Uh, following in line with our company's mission and our principles, we also develop all of our participant materials in plain language that includes our screeners, our consent forms, and our moderator's guides. Um, and this helps to make sure that um, populations with limited or low health literacy skills are more likely to understand the questions that we're asking during sessions. So um, I also want to make a note that using plain language, particularly with consent forms, is really important for audiences with limited or low health literacy skills to make sure that they're understanding what they're signing up for, they're understanding how their input during the session will be used, and really understanding any risks that are associated with being part of the research. And we've had success in, um, in uh, uh, incorporating this plain language into those consent forms, even with some pushback from IRBs uh, that want us to use more um, research legalese in, in these documents, but we have had success in incorporating that. And lastly, uh, we pretest our moderator's guides, which is, of course, best practice, but it's particularly important with participants with low health literacy skills to participate in those dry runs and test through the mod guides, just to make sure that we're asking questions in a way that is intended and that they're understanding um, how we've constructed the questions um, so that the actual sessions are engaging and, and um, comfortable for participants. So on to the implementation phase and actual data collection. So once we've reached those audiences that we talked about through recruitment and screening, we want to be sure that we're using data collection methods that actually make it easy for them to participate in the session. So some of the strategies that we've used include uh, using visuals in sessions. So um, we've used uh, strategies like collaging before, where we ask participants to select images that represent how they feel about a particular topic and then we'll follow up with the participants um, and ask them to explain the reasons they chose those images. So um, that's a great way to get participants with low or limited health literacy skills to articulate what they think about a particular topic without having them um, to have to come up with the words themselves. Um, we've also had success in using these uh, collaging exercises in person and online, uh, so through the AHA platform, which some of you may be familiar with, um, but AHA allows participants to create and maintain these digital diaries and do some neat things like uploading video diaries from their smartphones um, and answer different research prompts. Um, so that's something that you can implement both in person and remotely. Uh, another strategy we use, we use scale questions uh, with low literacy participants. Um, this is another great technique to get participants to express how easy or difficult a task or overall navigation was. Um, these skills are super easy to use. You also have the flexibility to print them. So if you're in person, the participant can actually physically indicate where they fall on the scale. Again, they don't have to come up with the word or numerical value for that. Um, and this also works remotely as well. Um, we've had success screen sharing these scales so that the participant can actually visualize where they, where they perceive they fall on the scale of understanding. So it's a great way for them to be able to uh, provide feedback about their assessment. We uh, asked participants to bring their own devices to testing. Um, of course, these are mobile things, smartphones, tablets, and devices they're comfortable with. This really helps eliminate any intimidation the participant may experience from having to use or learn a new device on top of completing certain tasks in a usability session. And then lastly, uh, 
One technique we use is uh, probing when participants self-writings of comprehension and actual comprehension of the information are not aligned based on what we're seeing in sessions. So this is particularly helpful when we're in sessions and participants may be demonstrating from what they're doing or what they're saying that they're misunderstanding information on the tool, but they're providing verbal feedback that they understood everything. So we'll probe on the particular content to get more feedback on what their actual um, understanding of the content is. So now I'm gonna play a short video. It's actually uh, just audio um, that we included here uh, from a diary study that we did that was part of a larger study to inform personas. And this video is from a diary study um, that we did on the AHA platform that I talked about a little bit earlier where we asked participants to talk about some challenges that they had in choosing their health care. So I'm gonna cue this up. And during that time, we're uh, the coverage that she will get because we had uh, a history of a couple of miscarriages before. So we wanted to make sure that we pick the best, provi the best provider and the best hospital that we can get. Uh, also, we had, uh, we had some restrictions due to my wife because we are Muslims. So my wife preferred to see a female uh, OBGYN. So, so that was just a clip from, um, again, a, a video that this participant uploaded using the AHA platform. And our participant here, he's explaining the importance for him after he and his partner had several miscarriages, um, that it was uh, important to find the right plan that also included the right doctor. So this platform really gave the participant the opportunity to talk about a personal experience to shape their understanding and experience with healthcare in a comfortable and natural way. Um, and it gave us great feedback to develop uh, personas for this project. Okay, and then the last step of the inclusive research process analysis and reporting. Um, during this phase, we really like to use a collaborative analysis process to get input from a range of perspectives. Um, and we do this both internally, so within our teams, um, to analyze the data and externally by engaging clients and other stakeholders. So this approach really gives us an opportunity to get weigh in from a range of different perspectives about how we're seeing the data and interpreting those findings um, and ultimately helping us to shape the recommendations. So as you could imagine, uh, getting through that analysis process with a, a range of different um, uh, people with varying perspectives can be challenging. So we use a few different techniques to facilitate these conversations, uh, one of which is affinity mapping. So the picture on the slide um, shows what that looks like at the end where um, individuals in the group write down ideas that come to mind from what they're hearing from the data, and then at the end, we're able to cluster and group those ideas that are related to kind of see what themes are emerging or, or um, what kind of ideas came out of the research. And then lastly, uh, when considering inclusivity and in analysis and reporting, it's important to consider how to synthesize findings across studies um, uh, when participants represent those from both lower and higher literacy levels. So if your sample is made up of uh, folks with low health literacy skills and higher le health literacy participants, look at how, if at all, those groups are interacting with the tool or understanding information differently. And it's really important to highlight these different perspectives, um, to highlight uh, the differences in reporting. And so one group's perspective isn't buried within the others. And this will help to make sure that the recommendations that come forward are inclusive, um, both to low, low literacy, low health literacy users as well. All right, and just last piece here, some considerations for health literacy and research during COVID-19. So as like many of you, we've had to adjust and adapt to continue research during COVID-19. And, and with that, we've also had to rethink the inclusive research process and how to be inclusive, inclusive in a time of virtual testing. So there's a number of constraints when doing remote testing. I'll just touch on some of them here for the sake of time, but um, one of the most difficult things is 
being able to meet participants where they are and ensure inclusivity um, in our research. So with remote sessions, we've been able to reach a wider range of participants geographically, but there are some technology considerations there. So we've conducted tech checks prior to sessions where we asked participants to sign on 15 minutes uh, or so before sessions to help troubleshoot any connection issues. And this really helps participants feel more comfortable once they get into the session that they know how to use and um, uh, navigate. For material testing, uh, we've been able to mail print materials to those participants so that they can uh, review those materials. Um, and then we can uh, look at how they're interacting with them with webcams. Um, when possible, we've provided webcams if participants do not have them and they want to be a part of the research. Um, and then lastly, we've also included telephone as a mode of data collection. So we know testing completely remote means, means that we're only recruiting select people, people who have high speed devices and high speed internet and opening up to phone um, helps us to broaden our pool of participants and be more inclusive that way. So. I hope some of those tips are helpful. And with that, I will pass it over to Brittany to give you some real life examples and case studies uh, of, of where we've done this on different studies at Communicate Health. Thanks, Nikiva. Um, so we're gonna talk about a few um, examples of how CH has blended various methods of pulling from UX and more traditional market research qualitative approaches. And then also how we considered health literacy for each of these projects. So the first one, uh, we worked with Massachusetts Health Connector. So they're an online health insurance marketplace and we worked with them to better understand their members as people so that they could, under, so that they could um, design their websites and other resources to be more in line with the needs and goals of their members. So we combined a traditional qualitative method uh, with human-centered design methods when approaching our research strategy. So first we looked at previous, previous research that MHC had actually collected. Um, so we had done usability testing with them before. And we also looked at analytics on their website and then customer feedback from their member surveys. And from there, we actually learned that um, members uh, they wrote in their customer feedback that the website was too difficult to understand or the enrollment section included jargon and there was also misleading information. So we went into our research already knowing that this would be a population with lower health literacy. So uh, with this in mind, uh, we use the human centered design process to empathize with our users and tailor our research strategy to use plain language and diverse research methods that could help us better understand um, their health insurance experiences. So in recruiting, we um, worked with Massachusetts Health Connector to recruit both current and former members. And this was important so that we could reach um, the audiences that were actually using their services and tools. So uh, we were able to conduct triad interview sessions, which are very similar to focus groups, um, just on a smaller scale. And then we also followed up with a few online activities. Um, and then Nikiva touched on this a little bit, but we did um, do a video diary using that AHA platform. And then we also did a collaging activity where participants could share images of their experiences um, in their health insurance journeys. And we also had a wishing wall activity where we had sentence starters. So something like health insurance feels like, or I trust health connector when they. So these just helped um, participants uh, communicate their experiences in different ways. And this allowed for more inclusivity um, in our data collection. And then lastly, we also um, worked internally to synthesize the data. And we also got um, our client's perspective when we did a human-centered design workshop and we use digital whiteboards for design thinking methods. Um, we use whiteboards like Mural and Miro, and these were really helpful to just have more of a collaborative um, process. And on the next slide, uh, this is just a quick example from the collage activity. So this participant, they had to explain using an image and um, supporting text 
um, about their decision-making process for um, choosing a health insurance plan. So this participant, they were really confused at first about how to apply for health insurance. Um, they kind of were jumping through hoops in terms of figuring out who to call. There was um, confusing uh, correspondence through the mail. Um, and they also had to do uh, online research to find out how to actually get help from Massachusetts Health Connector. So ultimately, these diverse methods um, really helped us find common themes across our data and then make informed um, recommendations. And we have one other case study that we'd like to share, and I'll pass that over to Carrie. Thanks, Brittany. Um, and I'll also add to what Brittany said, and Akiva mentioned this too, what we found in a lot of our research is that that collaging activity and using a lot of images um, and imagery for people to choose from works really well, specifically for people with low health literacy, because they tend to think more um, in imagery and in pictures. And so it really elicits a lot more of a response than just getting a written response. So we have found that to be a really great technique. Um, and then lastly, just to kind of wrap us up, uh, we wanted to share a case study that we did in collaboration with the University of Maryland on their Healthy Me app. Um, they were really interested uh, in designing this app specifically for communities um, who identified as African American as well as Hispanic and looking at the ways in which they would go about using this app that gave them information about their health um, and different health issues that they or may not be struggling with. So for our testing specifically, um, we collaborated with the University of Maryland and community centers that they had established partnerships, partnerships with um, to get Black and Hispanic participants into the study so that we were testing with the folks that were actually gonna be using the Healthy Me or Me Salute app um, to ensure that we were really capturing the feedback from these populations that would be the primary users we also um, ensured that participants met limited literacy qualifications. So we used criteria that require participants to have no more education than a two-year degree. It also included a three-question assessment to recruit low information-seeking participants. So that was all part of our screening process once we partnered with these community centers. Uh, this was pre-COVID, so we were able to conduct all of our usability sessions in person in this app um in particular was just designed for android devices so we were also screening and asking about that um, and prior to usability sessions uh, we also conducted a usability audit of the healthy me me salute app to evaluate the app's usability and user interface um, to see how there were things that we could change before we went into testing um, as part of our best practice and one of the things that we learned and we found with this is that, um, as Nikiva had mentioned earlier, having those scales is really important. So we use the BERT scale, which is a subjective design scale. Um, it's like the, the, I don't remember exactly the acronym, but it's like the bipolar emotional scale to really get a sense of people's design. So instead of just asking like, what do you think of the look and feel of this? Um, there's questions like rate this in terms of its friendliness to non-friendliness, its warmth, or does it feel more cold? And we're not doing that necessarily to collect any quantitative data, but really anchor the participants so that they can um, tell us about uh, their experiences and how they perceive look and feel of the app. Um, we also had a Spanish moderator, Spanish uh, moderate the, the sessions with our Hispanic users. Um, and one of the things that we found, uh, a couple of things that were really interesting with, with this is that um, there were, instances within the app on the Spanish speaking version that were actually written in English. And so going through that and for our clients to actually hear how problematic that was, that even if it was a word or two embedded in the app that was still written in English, that um, it caused a lot of fr friction for our Spanish speaking um, participants that were part of that study. Um, another thing that we found that was really interesting with regard to this is that we had a toggle uh, that was a yes only question or a question asking participants about their level of sexual activity. Um, and with older African American participants, we found that this was uh, particularly problematic. Uh, a lot of them said things to us like, that's really none of your business and uh, I'm not sexually active anymore. I'm 65 years old. 
So we took a lot of that feedback from testing with that population um, and redesigned the way that that question was worded and made it uh, not a required field if people selected that they were 55 and over. Um, so that's just a couple of things that came out of that particular study um, where we were using inclusive research with an inclusive uh, design at the end of it. And then lastly, to wrap us up, because we're interested in your questions as well, we see there's a couple in the chat feature. Um, we kind of come back full circle with this, where uh, we learn from inclusive, inclusive research the kinds of things that we need to be reflective of and we need to integrate into new products and services. Um, and we address these barriers through accessible design. So we ideate and we iterate on those types of things after the research process. We go into prototyping and then, if, of course, back to testing um, with a lot of these products and services. So we kind of come full circle with that um, in our human-centered design approach. So I will pause there. It looks like we have a couple of chat questions that are coming through in the Q&A. Um, so thank you so much. And we will we'll, uh, take a look at these and sort of dig into uh, what folks are asking. So. Uh, it looks like Agnes has a question for the collaging activity. Do you provide a bank of pictures or the, do the participants search for something they can relate to? Um, yeah, that's a really great question. So we have determined that roughly around 60 pictures or 60 images is sort of the sweet spot for people to choose from. Um, so we do provide them in a lot of our studies where we have those pre-populated images for people to choose from, whether it's in a digital or a print fashion. Um, and we exclude things like health or doctors or like an image of a doctor's building or a, a physician themselves um, so that we can really get at the emotional and sort of social piece of it um, and less likely around that. So we do typically give them a pretty confined um, area of things to choose from for their images. Hopefully that answered your, your question. Um, another question, what is your favorite online tool for shared analytics? and affinity mapping. Um, I will actually pass that to Brittany since she is our analytics person um, and she can talk a little bit what her favorite tools are. Um, thanks, Carrie. Uh, so is the question, can you repeat the question about um, analytics and favorite online tools? Yeah, so which are your favorite online tools for shared analytics slash affinity mapping? Sure. So for affinity mapping, I will say, so we recently used um, Mural, and that was for the project I was talking about before with Massachusetts Health Connector. It's not like a perfect system at all. There are some kinks for sure, but it's really cool because you can pull in sticky notes, similar to how you would, you know, if you were in person and had a, use post-it notes to make your affinity maps, um, and you can collaborate um, across teams so you don't have to be next to somebody. Um, so it's a that's a really cool platform as well. Um, in terms of analytics, so um, more so for like web analytics, we do use um, Google Analytics to you know track more on websites and things like that. I hope that was helpful. And then we have one question from uh, Kuni. I think I'm hopefully pronouncing that correctly. Uh, what is the reason for limited technology use uh, question in the screener that we had? So we have a question in our screener that um, asks about limited technology use. So uh, Nikiva, do you wanna, do you wanna tackle that one? Yeah, so we include that to make sure we're getting a range of um, people with different uh, tech use. We definitely don't want all super users, as Carrie mentioned. Often folks with lower health literacy and um, lower literacy skills um, have lower tech use. So we that's one of the proxies that we use there. I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that, Carrie. I don't think so. I think you, I think you covered it all. Thank you very much. Uh, we have another question. This is this is a great question too. Um, how do you recommend setting up an inclusive research approach when it's not a core company value? Um, great question. Uh, I think it's sometimes a struggle to get buy-in either from stakeholders or sometimes part of a, a company culture 
when it's not part of the value like it is at ph but i think one of the ways is just really um, driving home the fact that the more inclusive you are the more excellent your research will be um, because you're pulling from audiences that represent the world right or represent the the populations in which we live and so when we are able to um, actually include all of the users in our research um, we actually make our research and our products more excellent and i think that that also ties back into the slide that we had earlier about health literacy is that when you design products and services and do research on populations um, who are historically marginalized and, and excluded from research then your products and services are going to be better for those individuals that are typically excluded or that might be low health literacy or have accessibility issues but that's also going to help your um, your populations who don't struggle with those issues. So it's going to make your products and services better all around. Um, I don't know, Nikiva or Brittany, if you have anything to add to that, but that's, that's what I would say for that particular question. Spot on. Okay, let's see if there's any other questions. It looks like we have something in chat. Um, any other any other questions that we have? We have about three minutes. If anybody else wanted to to chime in, or if they wanted to post a, a question on Q and A, okay, it looks like we have another question uh, from Agnes. Do you do any guerrilla recruiting? That's a great great question. Um, at CH, we do very little of that, although um, there are there have been a couple of projects where they've been more contextual inquiry, inquiry. And so we've kind of had some predetermined folks that we knew we were going to talk to in certain situations, whether they were rural populations, um, talking to physicians, for example, in those populations. And um, we kind of organically started talking to a lot of people in those areas just to collect as much information as possible. Um, but I would say it's not one of our tactics as much at CH, um, mostly because a lot of our clients want to know exactly who we're recruiting, what that recruiting strategy looks like, and then how we're getting in uh, limited and low health literacy folks. So um, I have definitely done it before in other settings, but it, it can be a little bit tricky when we're thinking about health and healthcare related things. So thanks for the question. That was awesome. Um, another question is, uh, are there any sales benefits you have found useful to pitch when recommending inclusive research? Um, that's a great question. I think in our particular environment, we don't have to push as hard on, on that. A lot of our clients are actually asking us to do that. For example, we um, work pretty closely with the National Eye Institute, and so we just did a lot of usability testing with people with low um, vision uh, or people who identify as limited vision users. And so a lot of our clients are actually pushing us to do that kind of stuff. And so we don't necessarily have to make those sales pitches, but I know that it's definitely a challenge that, that people face. Um, I don't know, Brittany and Akiva, if you, if you feel like we've had to do that at CH and maybe I haven't been part of those projects, certainly certainly time in. Um, I would agree with Carrie. Um, a lot of our clients are mostly on board with being more inclusive, but I will say similar to Carrie's point earlier, really kind of advocating for inclusive research and using the research that's already out there. So using statistics uh, about health literacy and how um, it does affect the majority of the population. I think those points really um, help in kind of um, marketing your point of why we should do inclusive research in the first place. Um, and it looks like we're at time, but there's one last question uh, from Agnes. Do you ever conduct research where your clients live and work as opposed to in a lab? Um, and the question is yes. Um, and I think we are pushing to do a little bit more of that. For example, we do some work with the Center for Medicaid and Medi Medicare and Medicaid Studies. Um, we sometimes are in a sort of traditional focus group lab setting with them or doing remote testing, but we have also done um, work where it's a bit more ethnographic, where we've gone into homes and we've conducted research with them in their homes. Um, 
to see sort of, again, that general context and also to have them using with their devices that they use most naturally. And so that, um, that has been really valuable uh, to see because there's a lot of elements that when they're either using their phone in a lab, obviously, or they're using their stuff, um, or our computers, or they're connecting remotely, we don't get that context. So um, yes, we, we absolutely do do that. And I think having that real authentic in-home experience is, is very valuable for our research. So. Okay, uh, I don't want to hold folks up. I know it's, it's one o'clock. Uh, and you all have been a wonderful audience with some really great questions and appreciate um, all the questions and, and thoughtfulness that, that you gave us towards the end here. Um, so thank you so much for your time and thanks again to both UXPA and QRCA for uh, walking us through this whole process of setting up Zoom and everything getting us started and just all the collaboration that we've had so far. Um, both organizations are wonderful, and CH um, is very grateful for the opportunity to take some time this afternoon and chat with you all. So thank you, uh, Carrie, Nakiva, and Brittany. I'm looking at the comments um, in the actual uh, comment box, and it seems like, you know, they're raving about the presentation, um, that it was very great and insightful. So very exciting. I can't wait to dig in uh, myself. Again, this presentation is recorded. If you guys have any additional questions or follow-up, please reach out to me. Uh, and also, the recording will be made uh, available within the 72 hour time period. So thank you again, Communicate Health. Um, thank you again, our QRCA and UXPA members for joining us today. And again, check our UXPA.org website for upcoming um, education short courses, webinars, and our 2020 at home conference. So with that, I'll give you guys the rest of your day back and have a good one. Thank you. Alrighty, bye.